Welcome to the Great Adventure Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. So this is the 22nd session in this series, and you can see here we are. We're actually at effects of sleep on breathing, number one. So we're going to approach this like a, with the enthusiasm of the kid in a candy shop. And um, just a reminder about the respiratory balance, remember that central respiratory drive and ventilatory muscle power need to be adequate to overcome the respiratory load. And just to give you a brief preview, sleep affects both central drive and ventilatory muscle power, as we'll find out. The key feature is that nobody breathes as well while asleep as they do while awake. And therefore, respiratory disorders often present first during sleep. So today we're going to talk about sleep architecture, just a brief primer. I'm not going to go into this in any of the detail that a sleep medicine physician might. We're going to talk about the effects of sleep on control of breathing, um, ventilation and apnea during sleep. We're going to come up with some normal values. And does sleep apnea cause SIDS or harm to infants? So first, sleep architecture, a brief primer. There are basically two types of sleep non-REM sleep, or sometimes in infants referred to as active sleep, REM is rapid eye movements, and REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. So you can be awake. There are now three stages of non-REM sleep, um, as depicted here, and then REM sleep. So during the night, one starts awake, goes into non-REM sleep, comes up to a relatively short REM period, and then goes into deep sleep again, or non-REM sleep, as the night goes on, the non-REM sleep periods become shorter and the REM sleep periods become longer. So adults spend approximately 20% of time in REM sleep, um, approximately 50% of time in stage two non-REM, 10% in stage one um, non-REM, and 20% in stage three run non-REM, which is the deepest non-REM state. Ordinarily, uh, let's say one goes to sleep at about 11 o'clock at night, wakes up at, let's say, 7 in the morning. Um, there is some developmental um, changes here. So in adolescence, for example, you probably remember when you're an adolescent that you tended to go to sleep later and then wake up later. However, as time goes on, you may have a grandparent or somebody who comes to visit, and they may want to go to sleep as early as 8 o'clock, but be awake at 4 in the morning. Someday you will get there. This is developmental. Uh, this is developmental, as I mentioned. What's plotted here is the percent of total hours of sleep time, percent of sleep time in REM sleep, and then percent of sleep time in non-REM sleep. So adults spend about 20%, roughly, of total sleep time in REM. Infants, however, spend about 50% of total sleep time in REM. And note that their total hours of sleep is much more, about twice, what it would be for an adult. Preterm infants spend even more time in REM sleep uh, than is shown here. So what are the effects on control of breathing? This shows a brain. There are basically two uh, types of control of breathing, as we've discussed. Uh, behavioral um, control of breathing anatomically housed in the cerebral cortex, automatic control of breathing anatomically housed in the brainstem. And note that the reticular formation, which actually controls your state, sleep or wakefulness, is located anatomically fairly close to control of breathing. So it is not surprising that sleep would have a profound effect on control of breathing. So in non-REM sleep or quiet sleep, it turns out that breathing is controlled entirely by the automatic system. So there is a slight central depression in breathing compared to wakefulness. There is regular timing and amplitude. If you think about um, watching somebody breathe when they sleep, probably what you're used to seeing is relatively deep, even breaths that occur throughout the night. There is decreased chest wall stability, as we'll talk about next time. And compared to wakefulness, there is mild hypoxia and hypercapnia, even in normal individuals. REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep, or active sleep, is very different. Breathing is controlled entirely by the behavioral system, so it's not controlled by chemoreceptors. There is irregular timing and amplitude of breaths, um, although you may not have noticed this in people. 
If you've watched a dog sleep sometimes, when their eyes are going back and forth, you'll see that their breathing pattern is very irregular. There is marked inhibition of skeletal muscle tone, except for extraocular muscles and the diaphragm. And there's marked hypoxia and hypercapnia compared to wakefulness, even in normal individuals. This plots ventilation and gas um, exchange in a normal individual during sleep. So you can see that from wakefulness through non-REM sleep to REM sleep, total ventilation decreases. Total volume decreases, rate increases to some extent. Note that the axes here are not great. End tidal oxygen, however, gradually decreases in non-REM compared to wakefulness and a bit more in REM. CO2 uh, increases uh, in non-REM um, and REM compared to wakefulness. So if you're relatively normal, all right, um, so you may have a, a PO2 uh, that decreases compared to wakefulness, some during quiet sleep. Uh, in this example, it went up a bit in active sleep, but in many uh, depictions, it actually is decreased even more. CO2 also increases in sleep compared to wakefulness. But the magnitude of the change in O2 and CO2 is not great. However, if you have lung disease, Let's say you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and you start with a PO2 of around 55, okay? Then your PO2 is gonna drop significantly in the potentially dangerous zones in non-REM and REM sleep. AS is active sleep, which is REM. QS is quiet sleep, which is non-REM. And similarly, CO2, if you start with an elevated CO2, is going to get even worse uh, during sleep compared to wakefulness. So. While the changes in blood gases during sleep in normal individuals are not particularly alarming, if you have an underlying respiratory problem that compromises gas exchange, this can cause significant depression in PO2 and a significant increase in PCO2. Control of breathing, you've seen this before. You have central chemo receptors, peripheral chemo receptors, which stimulate the voluntary controller, and the motor output is minute ventilation. Sleep, in general, depresses breathing, probably primarily at this level. Just to show an example, this is a voluntary response to CO2. You've seen this. Um, if the curve is like this during wakefulness, the same individual would have a curve like this during sleep. It's a shallower curve. There is a diminished hypercapnic ventilatory response during sleep compared to wakefulness. This is a ventilatory response to hypoxia. Note ventilation against oxygen saturation and again wakefulness. And in this case, non-REM and REM sleep, you can see that the hypoxic voluntary response is also depressed more in REM sleep than in REM uh, compared to wakefulness. Let's look at ventilation and apnea during sleep. Apnea, of course, means not breathing. Uh, and there are two types of apnea. Central apnea, which some have said is won't breathe, so in this situation, if we plot abdominal motion, which remember correlates with diaphragmatic contraction, rib cage motion and flow at the nose and mouth, central apnea means that there is no respiratory effort. So consequently, there's no rib cage motion and no flow. Obstructive apnea, sometimes referred to as can't breathe, is a situation where one does continue to breathe as shown by the abdominal excursions here, representing diaphragm contraction. But there is occlusion at the upper airway, so there's no flow. And you can see, in fact, that ribcage motion starts to become paradoxical, as shown here. That is, as diaphragm contraction occurs, the ribcage is actually drawn inward. But again, if there's complete occlusion, there is no flow. We measure sleep or the effect of, of respiration on sleep in polysomnography. So polysomnography, we have a number of EEG electrodes. These are used primarily to determine sleep state. Um, extraocular motion um, sensors, which help us again with sleep state. EMG oftentimes is at the chin here, which looks primarily at genoglossus muscle activity. It's not shown in this example. And tidal CO2 is very important. Oral nasal flow. Rib cage motion by this band, a pulse oximeter abdominal motion by this band and electrocardiogram, which in this case is under the shirt and not shown. And this is an example of a um, polysomnogram. So you see eye motion up here, the uh, EEG electrodes to help determine sleep state here, 
chin EMG, which we talked about, electrocardiogram, oftentimes it's a microphone to listen for snoring, airflow, and you can see chest wall motion and abdominal motion here. And again, this is relatively normal. So saturation here is 98%. There really is not much in the way of snoring. Um, and this would be a fairly normal polysomnogram. This shows an obstructive apnea. So if you can see here, this individual is attempting to breathe, breathe rib cage distortion is inward and there's no flow. A hypopnea means there's less than 50% of baseline flow. So it's not quite complete obstruction, but it is obstruction. And then in this case, this hypopnea and uh, obstructive apnea is terminated by an arousal. That is somebody wakes up, regains upper airway skeletal muscle tone, which we'll talk about, and this terminates the, uh, the apnea as, as you can see here. So Dr. Marcus, Carol Marcus was a postdoctoral fellow here at Children's Hospital 1987 to 1991. And she did an initial study which defined normal child and adolescent polysomnography. She studied 50 subjects, uh, normal children, age essentially one to 17, about half males, BMI range, as you can see there. And there was a variety of racial ethnic uh, um, subjects during this study. This shows the number of subjects in each age range that you can see here. And these are the um, polysomnography parameters. So the apnea index, which is the number of apneic events per hour, was the normal here was 0.1. Uh, the range was 1 to 0.23, and normal values were less than 1. The maximum saturation of hemoglobin, as you can see, is 100. The range was 98 to 100. Minimum was 96, with a range of 89 to 92, and the mean minus two standard deviations was 92 to determine the normal range. The uh, number of episodes that where saturation was less decreased by 4% or more was 0.3, as you can see, less than 1.4 was the normal, and the change in arterial oxygen saturation during sleep that was uh, four plus or minus two, so the normal range was less than a change of eight. And you can see that there are few subjects that met these abnormal criteria, but these were based on statistics. Max entitled CO2, uh, normal range is less than 53. You can see this is the normal. Minimum uh, is shown here was 38, range 28 to 44. Change in saturation, increasing in this case, was seven plus or minus three, so it should be less than 13. And the time spent at uh, end tidal saturation greater than 45 tor was, as you can see here, 7, but plus or minus 19. So the normal value here was less than 60% of total sleep time spent at an end tidal CO2 of 45 or greater. This shows uh, a histogram of the number of subjects and what their peak CO2 was. So you can see that most people were in this range in the 40s. Uh, but there were some that got up as high as 53. Manisha Whitman, Whitmans, who was a postdoctoral fellow here in pediatric pulmonology 2002 to 2003, actually fine-tuned this a little bit. And um, her definition really is what tends to stand today. So for central apnea index, the normal values are less than five events per hour. For an obstructive apnea index, the normal values are less than one event per hour, but the obstructive apnea hypopnea index is less than 1.5 events per hour. Time spent with an arterial oxygen saturation less than 90% is zero. There shouldn't be any. Lowest saturation was 92% for normal values or greater. Entitled CO2 greater than 50 should be less than 25% of total sleep time. The definitions of um, apneas differ between children and adults. For obstructive sleep apnea, the definition or an obstructive apnea is defined as two missed breaths, all right? For adults, it's 10 seconds. Hypopnea um, is defined um, as having a drop in saturation of 3% or an arousal. In adults, it's a drop in saturation of 4%. Normal apnea hypopnea index, which is AHI events per hour, less than 1.5, in adults less than 5. Mild obstructive sleep apnea in children would be uh, an, an 
AHI of 1.5 to 5. In uh, adults, it's 5 to 15. Moderate is 5 to 10. Adults, 15 to 30. And severe is greater than 10 in adults greater than 30. So adults have much more obstructive apnea normally. There was a more recent study of normal neonatal polysomnography, which is shown here. So these uh, babies in general slept for about 260 minutes. About 43% of that was in non-REM sleep, and about 40% or 41% was in REM sleep. Transitional sleep, which means you can't really tell the difference, is about 16%. Total arousal index, that is total arousals per hour, uh, was in these normal neonates now, 14.7, and uh, the range was 6 to 22. A respiratory arousal index, that is events per hour associated with some respiratory event, was 1.2, that is much lower, and the range was 0 to 3.2. The AHI uh, events per hour was uh, 15, roughly, but a wide range, 1 to 38. Central apnea index was 5.4, but again, a wide range, so up to 27. Obstructive apnea index was 2.3, uh, up to 12.5. Mixed axiom apnea index was uh, 1.2 events per hour, up to 8. And the hypopnea index was, as you can see, up to about 13. Desaturation index up to 41. So neonates clearly have much more unstable ventilation than older children, than adults and adults. In Daftry's study again, the mean saturation was uh, 98, but the range was 95.5 to 97. The lowest saturation was 84 plus minus 4, and the range was 69 to 93. Time spent at saturation less than 90% was relatively short, 2% until the sleep time. Mean and total CO2, 35, but a broad range, 27 to 47. The max or highest end tunnel CO2 was 46, but again, a broad range from 37 to 55. The time spent at greater than uh, 50 tor was uh, 0.6. And again, the upper limit of normal there was about 13. This just shows some of the difficulty. If you can see the end tunnel CO2 tracing here, in a 16-year-old, you can see that there is a plateau so that you can pick off this CO2 quite easily. In Daftry's study, because babies breathe so rapidly, you don't really have as much of a plateau at end tidal CO2, so you can't really tell quite as um, accurately um, what the CO2 is. This just shows the apnea hypopnea index versus days and age, and there really is not a pattern here. I think you can see that there is a fair amount of variation, but it doesn't really correlate with age from 5 to 35 days. Does sleep apnea cause SIDS or harm to infants? So we're going to digress from physiology here a moment and talk about one of the most tragic clinical consequences of sleep. So this quote from Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament, and this woman's son died in the night, dated roughly 3,000 years ago, which suggests that people realized that normal infants could die suddenly during their sleep with no apparent warning or any indication that this might happen. We now, the usual clinical scenario is that a baby is put to sleep by the parents or caregivers and they come back later to find that the baby has died during that time. In some cases, parents or caregivers have been within hearing distance and have come back within 30 minutes or so to find that the baby has died during that short period of time without any sign of struggle or anything that was going on. If we look at national or international statistics, a medical cause for this death can be found in a small proportion of these kids, maybe 10%, 10 to 15%. The remainder, uh, by definition, there's nothing in the death scene investigation or in the autopsy that indicates the cause of death. So the definition of sudden infant death syndrome is the sudden unexpected death of an infant under one year of age with onset of the fatal episode apparently occurring during sleep that remains unexplained after a thorough investigation, including performance of a complete autopsy and review of the circumstances of death and the clinical history. So the key feature here is that the death has occurred 
suddenly and unexpectedly, and at the end of a thorough evaluation, the death is unexplained. Nationally and internationally, when diagnosing the cause of death in an infant dying suddenly and unexpectedly during sleep, the following terms are used by medical examiners and coroners, but they are considered synonymous. So SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, sudden unexpected infant death, sudden unexpected death in infancy, undetermined, they basically all mean the same thing, and that is that the infant's death is unexpected and unexplained. There are a number of non-scientific reasons why different coroners use different terms, but we're going to use the term SIDS in this particular discussion, and it's going to refer really to all of uh, these groups of babies. So this shows the SIDS rate per 1,000 live births um, from 1980 through about 2015, and I will just let you know that through 2023, this rate hasn't really changed much. So the blue indicates the United States rate, red indicates the California rate. And you can see that um, between 1980 and 1990, SIDS was not uncommon. 1.5 SIDS deaths per thousand live births means that about one out of every 600 to 700 babies who was born died from SIDS. That is not rare. Now, SIDS has fallen, and it's fallen through safe infant sleep uh, after about 1990, 1992, but it still remains the highest cause of death, or the most common cause of death, in infants in the post-neonatal period, that is, between one month and one year of age. This shows the age distribution for SIDS, so what's plotted here is mortality again per 10,000 births in this case, against age over the first year of life. You can see that most natural causes of infant death, uh, exemplified here by congenital anomalies, but nevertheless, tend to peak near birth and fall off exponentially. SIDS has a very different curve. It is actually less common in the first month of life. It peaks at about two, two to four months of age, and then it falls off so that 90% or 95% of SIDS has occurred by, by about six months of age, and we still have about 5% can occur in the second half of the first year of life. There are other terms that are sometimes used, but remember, we're going to just refer to all of these as SIDS. These are deaths per thousand live births in a variety of racial ethnic groups. American Indians, Alaska Natives, or other indigenous populations, Maoris in New Zealand, Aborigines in Australia, have the highest SIDS rate. Non-Hispanic Blacks are slightly lower, but they are, again, about two and a half times greater than uh, Caucasians. Non-Hispanic Caucasians are next. Hispanic Caucasians actually slightly lower, and Asian Pacific Islanders actually have the lowest rate. These uh, data are reproduced over many studies. Preterm infants also have an increased SIDS rate, as you can see here. SUID, in this case, when used epidemiologically, sudden and unexpected infant death, refers to uh, all babies who die suddenly and unexpectedly. SIDS undetermined and so-called asphyxiation, suffocation, and strangulation in bed or ASSB. But whether you use SIDS or SUID, you can see that preterm infants have about, at least the micropremies we're now dealing with, have about a five times increased risk compared to full-term infants. An interesting observation is that SIDS babies who are born and live at high altitude have an increased risk of SIDS. So if they reside in an altitude greater than 8,000 feet during infancy, they have a nearly a two times or about a two times uh, increased risk compared to infants who live under 6,000 feet elevation or 68,000 feet elevation. So hypoxia may play a role. Throughout history, most of the time people felt that SIDS babies were somehow due to parent neglect or perhaps maternal overlying. Uh, this study by Al Steinschneider in 1972 was significant in that it was a study that looked at or suggested the possibility that there were actually natural causes of, of death in this group of babies. And this suggested prolonged apnea as the mechanism. So it was really the beginning of the so-called apnea hypothesis for SIDS. Um, about this time, Richard Noya at Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, who was a pathologist, published seven tissue markers of hypoxia that he found in babies who died from SIDS compared to babies who died from other reasons. And these included increased pulmonary artery smooth muscle, brown fat retention, extramedullary hematopoiesis, 
decrease carotid body glomus volume, brainstem astroglial formation or scarring, increased chromaffin cells in adrenal medulla, and right ventricular hypertrophy. All of these are things you would expect to see in somebody who was hypoxic or more hypoxic than the normal. Now, I will have to say that most of these findings have not stood the test of time, but at least at the time that they were um, originally published, which you can see is in the early to mid 70s, uh, this contributed to the hypothesis that SIDS may be related to hypoxia or perhaps some other abnormality in breathing during sleep. This study from the National Institutes of Health basically um, looked at or asked the question, did babies who die from SIDS have observed apneas prior to death? Now, unfortunately, the question was not specific. And it only asked the question, was your baby apneic at some time prior to death? And you can see that SIDS parents, okay, indicated that their babies were about three times more likely to have had an apneic event than control infants. It varies by birth weight. The overall group was a statistically significant um, value. So this basically contributed or added fuel to the fire to the so-called apnea hypothesis. So the feeling here is that not all, but some babies might die from apnea. And again, not all, but some babies with apnea might die from SIDS. The question was how big was this overlap. This really prompted the clinical practice of home infant apnea bradycardia monitoring. So babies, as you can see, were placed on a monitor which measured chest wall impedance, that is movement of the chest, and an electrocardiogram. So it alarmed if the baby had an apnea greater than 15 seconds or heart rate less than 80 at one month, 70 up to three months, and 60 thereafter. So the implication was that babies who were found with apnea of infancy, that is, they were found uh, with color change, blue or pale, not breathing, and required some intervention to uh, restore breathing. The implication was that these babies were SIDS interrupted. That is, that these were serious events and infants were at high risk for recurrent events and death. These babies usually were brought to the hospital for diagnostic evaluation at that time. And if no cause was found, they should be placed on home apnea bradycardia monitors until they had no apneas for at least three months. However, during all the time that home apnea bradycardia monitoring was used, SIDS rates did not fall. David Southall in the United Kingdom published a study in the early 1980s, and he did prospective 24-hour recordings of breathing pattern and ECG in nearly 10,000 infants during the first six weeks of life. He put these recordings away, 29 subsequently died from SIDS. And then he pulled those out and compared them to matched controls. What he found was that no SIDS infant showed prolonged apnea or cardiac abnormalities on those prospective cardiorespiratory recordings. Or put another way, basically doing recordings of breathing pattern or heart rate in the first six weeks of life did not predict which infants would die suddenly uh, from SIDS or from another cause. Nevertheless, the NIH held a consensus development conference in 1986, and they concluded that there were indications for home um, infant apnea bradycardia monitoring, and these were infants who had an apparent life-threatening event, as, was, as it was described in those days. And as I said, that is loss of consciousness, not breathing, and requiring intervention to revive the baby. A sibling of two or more SIDS victims at the time was thought to be at increased risk. Siblings of one SIDS victim was actually, at this point in time, not thought to be at increased risk. And symptomatic preterm infants, that is, preterm infants who had a clinically observed apnea within the week of before discharge from the NICU. And so these babies were, in fact, monitored uh, during this time based on recommendations from the NICU. So basically, the idea was that home monitors were designed to protect infants at risk from life-threatening cardiorespiratory events. However, it became clear that some infants have died even while on home monitors. The SIDS rate has not decreased as a result of, mon of home monitoring. So what events occurred in these infants who used home monitors? And this gave rise to the 
so-called CHIME study, Collaborative Home Infant Monitoring Evaluation. This was an NIH-funded normal uh, multi-center study, and you can see there were five clinical sites, and one of them was here at uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles and LIC USC Medical Center, which is now Los Angeles General Hospital. And this was University of Southern California. There was a clinical trial operations center, which was technical support. There was a data coordinating and analysis center, and the NIH was heavily involved in this study. So this is a picture of the early CHIME steering committee, and um, you can see Tokop and Browers here uh, was the PI for the USC Los Angeles site. I was a co-PI, um, and I'm, as you can see, uh, not wearing a coat and tie. Uh, with this otherwise more or less uptight East Coast group. The study plan was that there were four groups of infants, healthy term infants, who monitored their babies during sleep up to six months of age. Preterm infants, uh, alti infants, and SID siblings. I want to focus for a moment just on the, home, on the healthy term infants um, in this study. So we designed our own monitor, and this basically was able to detect apneas using respiratory inductance plethysmography, which meant that we could identify both central and obstructive apneas. We also had an electrocardiogram, pulse oximeter to measure uh, oxygenation, a body position sensor because the whole issue of um, prone sleep being a risk factor for SIDS came out at this point in time. And this monitor was a computer, which in fact recorded events and normative data. So this is a picture of the monitor. You can see it was quite large, but we had this handy airport luggage device. This is a baby, and you can see ECG electrodes, rib cage motion, abdominal motion, pulse oximeter, a body position sensor on the back. And you can see that all the babies in our study were quite happy to be subjects in this study. This is the output of the monitor. So it's plotted here as an electrical sum of rib cage motion and abdominal motion to give you tidal volume. ECG, heart rate, pulse oximetry, and the pulse oximetry signal are shown in this. Now, when the study originally started, we thought normal babies would breathe like this. I don't know how many of you have watched a normal baby breathe, but I think you all agree that they breathe more like this. There might be a pause, a couple of breaths, another pause, some breaths, et cetera, et cetera. Breathing in, nor in infants is irregular, even in normal babies. Right, and consequently, heart rate was not... Uh, precisely controlled either. It went slightly up or down. But one of the things that was surprising from this study was how poorly oxygenation was controlled. So look here. Here's an oxygen saturation at 75%. Okay. We have a number of traces where subjects go for minutes uh, under 80, under 90% saturation uh, in the 80s. So babies don't control their oxygen precisely. Now this was a trace also from a normal infant who had a minor cold. The mother was not worried about the cold, but you can see up here is a 20-second complete obstructive apnea. There's ribcage motion, paradoxical movement motion, and saturation drops into the low 80s. Now, if this baby was in a newborn ICU and saturation dropped to the low 80s, this baby would have doctors and nurses crawling all over. We don't think that this is what babies should do, but CHIME Monitor showed in number of even normal infants that they have significant desaturations during sleep. During the CHIME study, we had uh, event recording thresholds. And for babies under 44 weeks, it was an apnea greater than 15 seconds, greater than 44 weeks, greater than 15 seconds. The heart rate varied. So greater than 44 weeks, the recording started if the heart rate was below 80, greater than 44 weeks post-conception now, if the heart rate started below 60. Alarm thresholds were uh, different. Since the experimental group, these babies might be on or might be prescribed a cardiorespiratory monitor, we felt we had to use the same criteria that are clinically, clinically used. So it was apnea is greater than 20 seconds for an alarm and heart rate less than 80 up to a month post conception and less than 60 thereafter. For healthy term infants, however, they would not have been placed on a monitor. So the alarm threshold was set at an apnea of duration of 40 seconds and a drop in heart rate of uh, 40 or less. We defined the events uh, as conventional events, which are those clinically uh, used on monitors at the time. 
So this would be, and there's greater than 20 seconds. Heart rates um, here, as you can see, less than 80 for 15 seconds, less than 60 for five. Over a month of age, less than 60 for 15, less than 50 for five. And then extreme events. Uh, and we would assume that these would get the attention of anybody. A 30 second apnea, heart rate less than 60 for 10 seconds, and in greater than a month of age, post term, less than 50 for 10 seconds. So these were called extreme events. Conventional events were pretty common. There were almost 7,000 conventional events recorded, and they were recorded in 444 of the 1,079 infants, or 41 percent. So, uh, as you can see, 7,000 events, about 5,000 of these were apneas without bradycardia, and um, maybe 500 or so were bradycardias without apneas. And this shows the percent of infants with at least one conventional event uh, plotted against days from beginning of monitoring, up to six months. You can see that symptomatic preterms, asymptomatic preterms, and uh, apnea of infancy preterms were the most common group here. Term siblings of SIDS victims actually had uh, a fairly increased number as well. And then down here, preterm siblings, healthy term. But note that of the normal infants, 40% or a bit more than 40% had a conventional event. If 40% of normal babies are having a conventional event, these are unlikely to be pathologic or serious events. And this is the reason that we define conventional events. And you can see that uh, conventional events, there were fewer of those, 653, in 116 of the 1,000 infants, or about 10%. Again, a little less than half were apnea without bradycardia. In this case, a little bit more than, let's say, 150 maybe, um, out of 653 were bradycardias without apneas. This shows the pattern for extreme events. Again, the preterm infants all had the most. Term infants didn't, and you can see here that healthy term infants had very few, or very few healthy term infants had. So we felt that these potentially were more likely to be pathologic. This shows the timing of, in this case, it's um, extreme events. And you can see that for the seven groups of babies here. And you can see that the term infants really rarely had events. After 43 weeks post-conception, none of the groups had statistically significantly different incidence of apneas than the controls. But prior to that, uh, you can see the preterm infant groups had increased apneas. So apneas tend to occur in preterm infants prior to about 41, 42 weeks post-conception. Both conventional and extreme events did have obstruction, which means that conventional monitors at the time would have missed these events. So 50% of conventional events and 70% of extreme events had obstructive apneas. And the mean drop in saturation was 11% during conventional events and 16% during extreme events. If we kind of look at duration of apnea here, a severity of bradycardia here, and drop in saturation here, not surprisingly, the longer the apnea or the worse the bradycardia, the greater the fall in oxygen saturation. This shows the time of one extreme event to the next. Now, this was important at a time that people were doing home infant apnea bradycardia monitoring. Um, it really isn't used as commonly now. But basically, what happened was if you went about six weeks, right, and had no additional events, you were not going to have the further one. So if you'd had one event and had gone six weeks, uh, you weren't going to have any more. If you'd had two, obviously the chance of having another one is greater because you've already had two. But again, after six weeks, no more. And three to four after six weeks, no more. So six weeks of no event seemed to be a threshold that you could safely discontinue monitoring. Now, one thing the CHIME study did show is that SIDS did not occur when apnea occurs. So here's the same graph that we showed you before. Number of apneas, okay, versus post-conceptual age. The blue is when SIDS occurs, between two and four months of age post-conception. So apnea is not occurring when SIDS occurs. So this suggests 
that the original apnea hypothesis we talked about is likely not correct and that apneas are not the cause of sudden infant death syndrome. Can we predict extreme events? So from the Chimes data, again, physiologic parameters were analyzed. 75 seconds prior to an event, one hour prior to an event, and two hours prior to an event. And these data were compared to comparable time intervals where no cardiorespiratory events occurred. Precursors of extreme events are shown here. And the ones that are significant is that there was increased heart rate variability within the two hours prior to an event. There was increased respiratory rate variability, increased tidal volume variability, increased short apnea duration, decreased oxygen saturation, and increase in periodic breathing. So these were precursors of extreme events in this group of infants. So that means that extreme events were preceded by evidence of autonomic nervous system instability, hypoxia, greater heart rate variability, and greater respiratory variability. Cardiorespiratory events do not occur de novo, but they are preceded by cardiorespiratory autonomic instability. Unfortunately, there's no practical way to detect this as yet. Can cardiorespiratory events cause neurologic dysfunction? Infants in the CHIME study performed Bailey scales of infant development two at 92 weeks post-conception. That's one year corrected age. We compared the one year Bailey scores between infants who had no conventional events, one to four conventional events, and greater than five conventional events. We could not use extreme events here because there were just not enough of those events to be statistically uh, valid. And what you can see is that those infants who had greater than five conventional events had a decrease in their uh, mental developmental index if they were term infants and if they were preterm infants. Cardiorespiratory events did not cause sudden death or acute disability. Do they cause more subtle problems? Infants with greater than five cardiorespiratory conventional events had a five-point decrease in mental developmental index at one year of age compared to infants with no events. So cardiorespiratory events are associated with neurologic dysfunction. What insights does the CHIME study give us about SIDS? It suggests here that this overlap is probably not large. Although SIDS is not the same as apnea, serious apneas do not cause death acutely, but they have long-term neurologic sequelae. Serious apneas are preceded by cardiorespiratory instability. And this suggests that autonomic dysfunction could occur in SIDS, which could cause cardiovascular collapse. And so it asks the question, is SIDS a catastrophic physiologic crisis? If normal infants do not precisely control breathing, heart rate, or oxygenation, then SIDS may not have to be a catastrophic physiologic crisis. Maybe it just needs to be a small problem which nudges or pushes an already vulnerable infant over the edge. This is hypothesis, by the way, not uh, proven. So what have we learned about the effects of sleep on breathing? Sleep depresses breathing. Nobody breathes as well asleep as they do while awake. In non-REM sleep, breathing is controlled by the automatic system. There is mild hypoxia and hypercapnia compared to wakefulness. Breathing is tightly related to blood gases, and the timing and amplitude of breathing are regular. In REM sleep, breathing is controlled by the behavioral system. There is marked hypoxia and hypercapnia compared to wakefulness. Breathing is not regulated by blood gases. Timing and amplitude of breathing are irregular. There is a decrease in, in skeletal muscle tone, except for the extraocular muscles in the diaphragm. And we'll explore this more next time. And respiratory disorders often present first during sleep. So remember the respiratory balance. Sleep now um, affects certainly central drive to breathing. It decreases it. And we'll find out that it also affects ventilatory muscle power. So next time we'll talk about the effects of sleep on breathing too. Thanks to our producer and director, Catherine Lewinter. And thank you for joining me in the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology.